Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the rugged and remote peaks of the Teton Wilderness of northwestern Wyoming. We visited this area in a previous episode, so if it seems familiar, it should. On the slopes of 10,258-foot-high Terrace Mountain is where our incident takes place, among pine and fir stands, with creeks lined with willow bushes. Yes, there are a lot of elk, moose, and mule deer roaming this area, but the most dangerous of its inhabitants are the grizzlies. On Thursday, September 13, 2018, Wyoming outfitter Mark Upton was guiding a client of his, Corey Chubon, on an archery elk hunt. Corey had come up from Florida after booking his hunt with Martin Outfitters out of Moran, Wyoming, about 20 miles south of Yellowstone National Park. They'd seen a lot of promising sign in the area, and the rut was well underway. For those of you who may not be familiar with the term rut, it means the mating season for elk. During this time, the bulls bellow long, high-pitched screams that echo down valleys and across ridgetops for miles. The bulls use these calls, known as bugles, to locate each other and rivals as well, and even assess the age and aggression of each other. Younger bulls will typically have higher and shorter bugles, while older bulls will sound raspier and even have chuckles at the end that sound as if they're laughing at their rivals. Bulls can be called in by emitting a unique sound similar to what a female, or cow, elk will make. It is higher pitched, but more short in duration. Not only rival bulls use these bugles to locate each other, but hunters use them too, to find where the elk they are hunting are located. Elk hunters will mimic these mating calls with various devices to locate or even call in a lone bull seeking to challenge a herd bull for his harem of cows. In previous episodes on this channel, we've discussed brown bears learning to mimic the call of mating moose, and there's strong evidence that they also use elk bugles to home in on elk as well, though they're not known to mimic the bugles. On our episode on this channel called The Archery Elk Hunt Grizzly Ambush of Ronnie Leeming, we discussed this very behavior, and after you watch this episode, check that one out too. It takes place in this same area. Mark and his client, Corey Chubon, had found some luck when they located and stopped a beautiful 4x4 bull. This bull had a tall, ivory-tipped rack of points with four tines proudly jutting from each main beam, and Corey decided it was well worth his tag. The men crept upon the bull, and Corey's arrow hit pay dirt and seemed to pierce the bull's lungs. The men followed the blood trail for quite a while before twilight signaled closing time for the day of hunting. The men agreed to come back and resume following the blood trail in the morning. The following day was Friday, September 14th, and the hunters immediately scurried back to the blood trail to continue pursuing the wounded bull. In elk hunting, it isn't uncommon for a wounded bull or even a cow to run quite a distance after being shot. The conventional wisdom is to sit down for at least 30 minutes or so to let the animal bleed out. If you rush to follow the blood trail, you may end up bumping it from its bed, where it's bleeding, and force it to run to another location, which can lead to the animal getting lost or even make it stop bleeding altogether due to the tissues around the wound shifting and closing off bleeding roots from the wound. The hunter's patience paid off, as after resuming where they left off, they found the bull dead just below a clearing. They carefully inspected the area around the dead bull and didn't see any sign of a bear visiting the carcass in the night, so they felt confident that they were not intruding on a bear food cache. Mark carried his bear spray on his hip and a holster as a precaution anyway, but it appeared they wouldn't need it. They wasted no time field dressing the bull and preparing the 220 pounds or so of meat for packing, and Mark carefully set his Glock pistol he carried on his hip a few yards above the carcass. To field dress an animal, a hunter takes a knife and cuts down the middle of the lower portion of the animal's body and through the layer of muscle into the gut. Through that opening, the organs and guts are removed, and other steps are taken to cool the meat to prevent bone sour or outright rot. The fall is usually left aside for scavengers to consume, but it can be an invitation for more than crows and coyotes. The men worked hard packing out the quarters of the elk's carcass and tying them up in a tree to cool. As it hung, the hunters returned to the remnants of the carcass to recover the hide and antlers. 
As the men surveyed the carcass and briefly considered the chore ahead, a thunderous racket of brush popping across the clearing above them drew their eyes up the hill. To their horror, a large grizzly bear was closing in on them at full speed, eyes fixed on them as she came. As she closed in on the men, she focused on Mark first. She tackled him to the ground as Corey fled uphill to grab the Glock on the backpack. As the bear wrestled Mark, Corey pointed the pistol at the bear and waited for a clear shot on the beast. When a good opportunity presented itself, he pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. He fussed with it a bit and aimed again, but it still didn't fire. To anyone unfamiliar with a Glock pistol, they have three built-in safeties. The first is the drop safety, which keeps the firing pin from firing sequential rounds without a trigger pull. The firing pin safety, which mechanically blocks the firing pin from moving forward. And the trigger safety, which features a discrete lever incorporated into the trigger. Each of these mechanisms is countered by the pull of the trigger safety. The trigger safety must be depressed before the trigger is pulled, or the gun will not fire due to the redundancy of the other mechanical safeties designed into the pistol. It is an ingenious and very safe design feature, but to anyone unfamiliar with the proper discharge of the firearm, it may prevent them from shooting the pistol. The grizzly then turned her attention toward Corey. As she turned in his direction, Corey attempted to toss Upton the pistol. Unbeknownst to Corey and Upton, the pistol fell uselessly only a few feet down the hill and out of his range and awareness. The enraged sow knocked Corey to the ground and began to chew up and claw at his chest. As he kicked and punched at her, she clawed and bit his legs and arms as well. By now, Upton had made it back to his feet, which drew the sow's attention. She turned away from Corey and quickly began attacking Upton once again. This gave Corey a chance to run away. As he ran up the hill toward the racked-up horses, he looked back in Upton's direction. He could see Mark standing on his feet trying to fend off the sow's attack. Corey sprinted up the mountain and jumped on one of the horses. He urged the horse on to the ridgeline of the 10,000-foot-high Terrace Mountain. He pulled out his cell phone and surprisingly received a signal. Authorities immediately dispatched a rescue copter to pick him up. The rescue team flew the helicopter to the location of the carcass, after Corey described where the incident occurred. They found the elk carcass around 7 p.m., and given there was only an hour or so of daylight and very little flight time left on the helicopter, decided to return at sunup on Saturday. When the rescue team returned to the location, they found a drag trail leading down the hill from the carcass. Believing it was from Upton's body, they followed it, only to find out that it was from the fall of the elk rolling down the hill. Near the elk carcass was a confusing scene indicative of a struggle. There was blood and debris obviously disturbed all around the immediate area, but some of that evidence was from the elk dying, the men gutting the animal, and from the struggle with the grizzly. The elk's blood trail crisscrossed with blood from the men, and it led to a moderate amount of confusion. It took a while for all the evidence to make sense, but the rescue team eventually found Upton's body 50 yards uphill from the carcass. Due to the fact that there was no drag trail up to where they found Upton's body, the team concluded that he was still able to walk about 50 yards up the hill after the initial attack and found his way there for the fatal second attack from the cell. Judging by the fatal wounds on Upton's body, the investigator concluded that his death at the second attack site was very quick. The sow, or her one-and-a-half-year-old cub, had bitten Upton's head, which caused his immediate death. His body had severe trauma inflicted upon it during the two attacks, but the bears left his body intact. They did not eat any part of Mark Upton's body. The empty can of bear spray Upton carried on his hip was found near his body. His Glock pistol was located downhill from Upton's final location, but uphill from the elk carcass, an initial attack scene. Given its final location, it appeared that Upton somehow recovered the pistol, only to lose it somehow, in his uphill climb toward the location of the final attack. Shortly after finding Upton's remains, Wyoming Game and Fish carnivore biologist placed three leg hold snares around the attack site. By Sunday morning, the investigative team landed a helicopter. As soon as they walked a short distance, they could hear the bawling of a bear caught in one of the foothold traps. They knew by the sound that they had snared the cub, which would mean the sow may be nearby and in a less than cordial mood after listening to her youngster holler. In an attempt to observe the snared cub safely, the investigative team tried to approach from an open angle with less cover. Given that grizzly sows are extremely protective, she was waiting up for them and heard them approaching her snared cub. 
She didn't hesitate to charge the five well-armed men. But when she could finally see how many people there were, she paused for a brief moment. The team took the opportunity to quickly discuss if they should shoot her or not. The decision was made by Officer Dan Thompson to take her. The four armed men and the group fired numerous rounds, dropping the protective sow in her tracks. The officers began their investigation of her and found her stomach to be full of elk meat. Her paws matched the tracks at the elk carcass, and the smell of bear spray could be seen and felt only a short distance from her. The team figured out that the bear spray Upton carried on his hip was not discharged in the initial attack, most likely due to how quickly it happened. They determined that the bear spray was deployed by Upton at the second attack site, where he received the fatal injuries that took his life. They collected her DNA to submit to the lab for analysis back in Laramie. After analysis of the 10-year-old, 250-pound sow, she was found to be very healthy with no apparent injuries or impairments. She had plenty of fat on her and was described as being in good shape. The cub was about 150 pounds and was sedated before being removed from the snare. Officer Thompson again made the call to kill the cub. It would later be revealed in Upton's autopsy that the cub had participated in killing him. Officer Thompson later said that the yearling cub was involved in the attack and contributed to the death of Mark Upton. He also stated that he had never dealt with a sow and a yearling cub attacking in this manner. He commented, as well, that the investigators could not agree with the idea that Upton discharging his bear spray during the second attack did no good. An important point that the state biologists pointed out was that the bears were not returning to a kill. They were not acting in defense of a carcass they were claiming. They also point out that the cub was a safe distance away from the men and was not in any danger nor being threatened by them. Nonetheless, the sow charged the men and attacked without hesitation. This is beyond rare behavior and very unusual. Officer Thompson said that the hunters were doing nothing wrong in their recovery of the elk carcass. They followed the best practices for hunting in grizzly country. He also indicated that killing the cub was the right thing to do because the sow had taught him that killing humans is a potential way to get food. Bears have remarkable memories when it comes to how they acquire food, and a cub who has shown any lesson will retain and use it in the future. Wyoming Game and Fish officials did not try to capture nor kill those bears, simply because their behavior didn't warrant it. They acknowledged that this type of bear behavior is something that cannot be ignored in this environment. Back to scary bear attacks. Today's episode takes us to a private campsite just north of Grand Lake and west of Rocky Mountain National Park in north-central Colorado. The valley floor is over 8,000 feet in elevation, but the gorgeous granite peaks around it tower to over 11,000 feet high. Not only the mountains are tall here, as the forests of lodgepole pine, Douglas fir, and bristlecone pine reveal their majesty. The oldest living tree in the world is 4,800 years old and is of the bristlecone pine species. The animals that frequent this area are moose, mule deer, elk, and bighorn sheep. The dominant predator of the area is the black bear. It is in this scenic and rugged backdrop that our episode takes place today. On Sunday, July 25, 1971, 31-year-old John Richardson of Denver, Colorado was camping with his fiancée, Linda Moore, and his brother-in-law, G.H. Waddell, at Holsworth Ranch. Moore and Richardson were set to tie the knot on the coming Saturday, looking forward to making a life together as husband and wife. Moore had recently received her doctorate degree from UCLA earlier this year at only 27 years of age. Mr. Waddell with his wife and three kids were staying in their RV and Richardson and Moore were camping in their own separate tents alongside their family. The scenery and company were an amazing background for the engaged couple to bid their last week as singles farewell and enjoy some time in the woods together. After dinner time and fun moments around the campfire, the campers began to wind down for the night. The Waddells began the nightly ritual of getting the kids into bed as Richardson and Moore crawled into their sleeping bags for a peaceful night's rest beneath the soothing blanket of stars laid out above them. Unbeknownst to the campers, a hungry black bear was lurking in the darkness. The aroma of their meal still hung in the air, wafting its way into its nostrils, beckoning it forward to what might be an easy meal. In the 1970s, it wasn't uncommon for visitors to forests to feed bears as they were found in parks or near campgrounds. 
This behavior conditioned bears to identify people as a food source, indirectly, but not always indirectly. The bear stealthily crept through the night, padding up to near Richardson's tent. For some reason, it was drawn to his tent, and there is no source that indicated whether he had food inside his tent or not, but he was nonetheless seen as a food source. Sources indicate that Richardson may have heard the bear nearby and emerged from his tent to investigate, but since he was alone at the time, there is no way to confirm this. At any rate, once he exited his tent, the bear attacked him. It bit him by the neck and shook its head back and forth, taking them to the ground in the process. Richardson fought back as best he could and yelled in terror for help as the bear was unrelenting in its attack on him. Moore heard his cries for help and was first to respond to them. She rushed out of her tent and yelled at the bear, trying to frighten it off. While she tried to rescue her beloved fiancé, the bear chased her and bit her on the back, leaving Richardson bleeding on the ground. At this point, Mr. Waddell roared from the RV, brandishing a frying pan, as if it were a broadsword. Waddell struck the bear about the face numerous times with such ferocity that the bear turned and fled into the forest. It was then that Waddell and Moore turned their attention to Richardson. The bear had severely lacerated his throat, from which his blood gushed quickly. His life ebbed as they tried life-saving first aid. The authorities were quickly notified and a search for the bear was underway. A professional hunter was brought in and tracked the bear using hounds. They relentlessly followed the bear as it covered several miles trying to elude its pursuers. After catching up with the black bear, they dispatched it and ended its predatory death campaign. Upon examining the bear, it was found to be of average size and health for bears in the area, weighing in at a healthy 200 to 230 pounds. There's no mention of the sex or age of the bear, nor if there were cubs present. Frequently, these kinds of attacks are from younger male bears who are just learning the boundaries between their world and the human world. Black bear attacks in Colorado have occurred on rare occasion, but the attack on Richardson was the first fatal bear attack in recent history, but it wouldn't be the last. We've discussed bear attacks in Colorado on this channel before, but they frequently happened after a human was providing food to the bear, as in the Donna Munson episode. That episode is interesting and worth a look if you have time. But in the episode on the young lumberjack Colin McClellan, in this episode, there is a component of predation and perhaps territorial defense. After reviewing the facts surrounding this attack, I'm left with a few questions. Do you think the attack on Richardson was a predatory attack or a defensive attack? The defensive attack possibility has validity in that once he emerged from his tent, he may have surprised the bear. Do you think the bear may have been habituated to find food at campsites? Do you think a frying pan is a better bear deterrent than bear spray? Would you have the courage of Moore and Waddell to physically confront a bear while it was attacking one of your loved ones? I look forward to reading your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. My parting comment is that I've skinned brown bears in Alaska, and once their hide is removed, it is apparent that their design hinges around two deadly actions. A bear's head is a big ball of muscle, and it looks like every one of those muscles ties into their jaws. As for their forearms, they are massive, with dense bone and muscle forming something similar to a mace from medieval days, crowned with five sharp claws. I still have three brown bear claws that I sometimes take out and press against my skin to remind myself how easily they pierce frail human flesh, and that is with the controlled pressure of a man. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the splendor of Jasper National Park in central Alberta, Canada. The town of Jasper sits at about 3,500 feet in elevation, but the granite peaks all around it climb to about 8,500 feet in elevation. The broad, rounded valleys, shaped by millennia of glacial activity, are packed full of dense stands of lodgepole pine and dug fir, interrupted with stands of quaking aspen, balsam poplar, black cottonwood, white spruce, and white birch. Common plant eaters you might see are white tail and mule deer, elk, moose, and woodland caribou. Bighorn sheep and mountain goats defy gravity on the vertical aspects of the area, and the predators of the area are black and brown bears, cougars, foxes, coyotes, wolves, and lynx. In the area surrounding Patricia Lake and along a trail system near Cottonwood Slough is a favorite and frequently visited trail. This trail system is adjacent to town and is a very convenient place for exercise and recreation for locals and visitors alike. On the evening of Saturday, May 24, 2014, a 25-year-old man, Etienne Cardinal, was riding his mountain bike down the trails, venting some of his youthful energy in the fresh air. 
He was a seasonal employee as a Parks Canada conflict specialist. He's a local and knew better than to go outside without packing his bear spray. He safely packed it into the holster on the side of his backpack and headed for the door. No source I could find indicated he carried or even owned a firearm. Etienne was only about 10 minutes from safely returning to town from his ride when an enormous roar interrupted the tranquility. He immediately knew it was a bear and that it was very close. So close, he wasn't sure where it was at first. Etienne glanced up from the trail just in time to see a huge brown bear turning toward him just off of the trail only a few feet. There was no time to take evasive action, nor try to avoid the attack. The bear quickly spun and swatted him with its massive paw on his back. The impact of the paw swipe sent him spilling onto the trail. After hitting the ground, Etienne rolled quickly to his knees and covered his head and neck with his arms and began to yell loudly in terror. As he braced for another impact from the paws, he could feel the angry bear pounce on him and begin to bite at his backpack. The only thing he could do was protect his head and neck and scream at the top of his lungs, hoping this would scare the bear away, cutting short the clearly defensive attack. As Etienne covered up on the ground, he could feel it pull at his backpack. Then suddenly it stopped. He looked around to see what the bear was doing, and as he looked up, all he could see was it scampering away quickly. His initial confusion soon gave way to understanding as the contents of his bear spray began filtering into his eyes and nose. He suddenly became aware that as the bear was biting into his backpack, it had found his bear spray container with its teeth and punctured it. The majority of the contents of the can sprayed directly into the bear's mouth and likely right into its lungs. Etienne quickly pulled out a cell phone from his backpack and called for emergency medical help. He knew the bear had raked him on his back with its claws during the initial attack and didn't feel any other wounds. He was quickly rushed to the hospital and his minor injuries were treated. He was released the same day. Park officials completed a search of the area for the bear but found neither hide nor hair of the bear but closed the trail system for a week as a precaution. Officials stated that Etienne did everything right and that the occurrence was just bad timing. They believed the bear didn't hear him as he approached and was startled into defending itself. I'm sure we can all agree that Etienne is fortunate, but this incident reveals some very interesting possibilities. Do you think that a bear spray suit is a good idea? The suit could be set up with a few cans of bear spray and once they're disturbed would immediately spray their contents in full measure. What is the risk of such a device? Do you think it would stop defensive bear attacks? We know that bear spray has a 90% effective rating, so what about the other 10% of the attacks? Would you be willing to purchase such a device to decrease your odds or injury of death from a bear attack? To scary bear attacks. Today's episode takes us to the remote backcountry of central Alaska, to the Chisana River and all of its rigor and difficulty. To the south lies Wrangell St. Elias National Park and its impressive mountains and glaciers. The Canadian border is about 40 miles to the east, depending on how tight you pull the measuring tape. The national park takes up about 13.2 million acres of as close to wilderness as you can find today, and to the north of the park is a 4.9 million acre reserve. This means that the land can be hunted and used, but it is a protected area from the encroachment of civilization. In contrast, you cannot hunt in the national park portion. The area here is mostly rolling hills with elevations that can dip below 2,000 feet, in contrast to the majestic mountains of the nearby park. It is mostly muskig, which is a Cree word for a low-lying swamp. It is covered with trees dwarfed by the poor soil conditions and tufts of floating grass, giving an illusion of solid ground. Here you'll find lots of peat-like material, which can go 30 feet deep and act like quicksand. Along the edges of the muskig, where the soil is, you'll find black and white spruce, willows, alders, and wildflowers. Caribou and moose are common, and the predators here include wolves, lynx, foxes, and black and brown bears. It is in this beautiful setting that our episode takes place today. In the late afternoon on Saturday, September 19th of 2020, 22-year-old Austin Pfeiffer's moose hunt had culminated in success. He and his friend, whom we'll call Matthew, shot a nice bull and tracked it until they found it dead. They gutted it and decided to return in the morning to finish cutting the carcass into packable sections and moving it back toward their camp. Austin was from Belleville, Ohio, and was an avid outdoorsman, enjoying fishing and hunting whenever he had the chance. Whenever Austin wasn't at work, he was out enjoying nature, hiking on trails and the like. 
but when he was at work, he worked hard as a foreman for a local tree service company and also worked at Game Master Taxidermy in town. He was set to turn 23 years old on the coming Tuesday and had been married to his wife since October of 2018. He and Matthew had been planning this moose hunt for the past two years. As the young men approached their moose carcass, there was no obvious sign a bear had been near it. They hadn't noticed any tracks nor scat in the area. They paused briefly and admired the bull they'd harvested. Then they realized that the fun was over and the work was about to begin. They worked out a system where Austin would partition the carcass into manageable pieces and Matthew would pack them the half mile back to their camp. They agreed to hang the partitions in a tree, but first had to move it to where the float plane could land and they could load it. As Austin prepared to start cutting the carcass into sections, he carefully placed his backpack and hunting rifle on the ground only a few yards away. He certainly couldn't hold it while he worked cutting the moose up, and they were in the home stretch of the hunt anyway. Neither Matthew nor Austin brought bear spray, as they had their hunting rifles. What more do you need to protect yourself in bear country? After the two loaded and bound a large bag of the moose carcass onto the backboard, Austin helped Matthew get the pack up on his back, and away he went. Matthew walked the short distance back to camp in about 10 minutes or so, then turned around and headed back to pick up more. He undoubtedly anticipated that by the time he got back to the moose carcass, Austin would already have the next section ready for loading. As Matthew was walking through the dense vegetation about 50 yards from where the carcass was, he glanced up as a frightening scene filled his vision. He saw a large brown bear in full charge mode, steaming toward him. He immediately shouldered his rifle and fired a warning shot, then another, and one more. The bear continued toward him until it got within about 20 feet. Then it flinched, as if it had been struck by something, and veered off from its attack. Matthew watched as the bear continued out of the area and placed his rifle back across his shoulder so he could continue the carcass in Austin. Matthew came around some of the vegetation, hiding the impromptu butchering site, and saw Austin laying on the ground. He was clearly dead as his body was torn up by a bear, and possibly the bear he had just shot at. Matthew immediately began jogging back to camp in the radio there. He called out to the air taxi and relayed the details of Austin's condition. The air taxi service notified the park service and the Alaska Wildlife Troopers, and they flew out immediately. Officials noted that Austin's rifle and backpack were found a short distance from his body. It was apparently just out of reach by the time the bear surprised him with its attack. They figured that the bear had managed to creep up very close to him before he noticed it as he worked on cutting up the moose and the dense vegetation surrounding it would permit that. They conceived that it was even possible that the bear had attacked him before he knew it was there. The authorities investigated the attack scene and noticed signs that the bear had tried to cache at least a portion of the carcass. The ground was disturbed and the portion of the carcass was covered with dirt and leaves, but they didn't know when this happened. Did it happen after the attack on Austin, or during the night before it? Officials said that the young men didn't do anything wrong in their safety practices. They said they found no evidence that any of Matthew's shots had injured the bear, and no sign it had stayed in the area. They followed the state laws and made sure to salvage all the meat from the moose carcass that they could. Since the park's founding in 1980, Austin Pfeiffer was the first person killed in a brown bear attack, although several people have disappeared in the park, never to be heard from again. When Austin's wife was notified of his death, she thought it was a terrible joke initially. She had a hard time coming to grips with the idea that he wouldn't be returning home to her. She says she's broken and sad that he's gone. She celebrates the wonderful memories they made in their short time together. His wife characterized her husband as a kind, caring, and patient man who loved her, as well as his friends and family. Well, that was a tearjerker, folks. After reading up on the details of this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think that bear spray could have prevented this attack? Do you think that the bear had been brought to the carcass by the smell of it being gutted? Do you think that this bear was a dinner bell bear, meaning that it had heard the report of the rifle and closed in to claim the carcass or its remains from hunters? I'll be glad to read your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to a remote cabin in the Washakie Wilderness area. The Kitty Creek drainage is on the east edge of Yellowstone National Park and is brush-covered and rugged. The peaks in this area easily soar above 10,000 feet in elevation and the valleys are crowded with dense stands of pine, fir, and aspen trees. Around every body of water you will find broad stands of willow bushes. The animals of this area include moose, elk, and mule deer. 
Predators of this area include wolves, coyotes, mountain lions, as well as black bears and grizzly bears. The brown or grizzly bears here are interior bears who don't get the benefit of seasonal salmon runs and consequently are smaller and more aggressive. On June 17, 2010, there was a biological research team working on Kitty Creek drainage. As part of their protocol, warning signs indicating ongoing bear research in the area and informing hikers of the trail closures were posted at each trailhead leading into the area. They were shooting grizzly bears with tranquilizer guns and putting tracking collars on them. This allowed them to follow the bears on foot or from a helicopter to see where they go at different times of year. In addition to the collar, the scientists frequently tattoo the lip of the bears for identification. The bears are then followed for several years while data is gathered for analysis by the biologists. They had seen the Irwins at their nearby family cabin, located about a mile from the trapping site, but failed to mention the research they were conducting in the vicinity. In the morning, they had snared two grizzly bears in the Kitty Creek drainage. One of them was a 5- to 10-year-old, 430-pound male grizzly bear. They tranquilized the bear with a dart loaded with telazol, a reliable bear sedative. Once the bear calmed down and stopped reacting to the stimulus from the researchers and showing the telltale open-eyed gaze the drug causes in bears, they quickly did their health assessments and placed the tracking collar. As soon as the drug begins to wear off, bears begin to blink their eyes rapidly, move their limbs, and smack their lips. Once the scientists see this reaction, they know that the bear will recover from the tranquilizer soon. So they leave the area immediately to let the bear come to its senses without incident. It was the end of the bear collaring season, and the scientific research team hadn't seen hikers in the drainage for their entire time there, which started on May 25th. They removed the signs posted warning people of the bear research underway on their way out. At about the same time that the bear was waking up from the tranquilizer, 70-year-old Irwin Evert was hiking up a nearby trail. Before he left, he told his daughter that he was planning on hiking up the bear research trapping area to see what the scientists were up to. He hadn't brought bear spray nor a firearm with him, as he and his son had run into bears frequently before and never had any serious problems. A few days prior to this, Irwin had a chat with his part-time hiking buddy and retired biologist Chuck Neal. He told Irwin that there was a bear research team up near his cabin and warned him against venturing into the woods any time in the near future. Irwin even called Chuck about a week before his hike to inquire about the bear research signs posted near his cabin. For the prior 40 years, Irwin enjoyed time at their family cabin with his beautiful wife Yolanda. He was very familiar with bears and just about everything else he might run into while he was in the forests. Irwin used the cabin as a base to explore the plant life in the area. He was a content transplant from Illinois and, for all practical intents and purposes, was now an unofficial native of the area. He was an excellent field botanist, and his magnum opus was his book titled Vascular Plants of the Greater Yellowstone Area. It was a guide to plants of this area and received acclaim from reviewers. He also knew the risks of entering into bear country and acknowledged that it is all part of the package. Bears like to be away from people, and the areas where bears live are frequently preferred by hikers. By late afternoon, Irwin was climbing up the trail. The peace of the early day had given way to gusts of wind, distorting sounds and twisting scents carried on the air. This is where the evidence gets a little confusing. The biologists contend that they had put up warning signs informing the public of the research they were doing on the bears in the area, but Irwin's family says the signs were removed prior to his hike. At any rate, Irwin hiked to the exact spot where the bear was nearly fully recovered from the tranquilizer. The researchers had left the area approximately 30 minutes before as the bear began to wake up. It is assumed that Irwin walked within threatening distance of the bear, and it responded to him as a perceived threat. It killed him in a violent attack that quickly took his life. He did not suffer, nor was any part of him eaten by the bear. When Irwin didn't return at his scheduled time, Yolanda called Chad Dickinson, a member of the interagency grizzly bear study team. He headed up to the trap site and found Irwin's remains in a remote point in the trail about two miles from the nearest road. The effort to recover his body finished up around 1 a.m., the precise attack details are not known, but the outcome was as terrible as any forensic reconstruction could detail. Wildlife agents immediately began a search for the bear. 
They tracked it using the newly placed collar and located it very close to the attack site. Agents killed the bear with a single shot fired from a hovering helicopter. DNA pulled from the bear's body conclusively supported that this was the bear that had killed Irwin. In the 33 years of researching bears, this was the first time a human fatality was connected to it. Wildlife biologist Dr. Servine indicated that the sedative used to knock the bears out is a dissociative drug, meaning that bears don't see people as they wake up. They are out of it long after the researchers leave the area. Therefore, it is impossible that the bear woke up enraged at people afterward. He describes anger as a human emotion and stated bears don't hold grudges. For those of you who may be wondering why the bear was killed, the reasoning behind this was that IGBST didn't know enough to exclude aggressive motives. The bear didn't eat Irwin, so a predatory attack was off the table. There were no cubs involved, as the bear was a boar, so it wasn't reacting in defense of cubs. The bear didn't have any obvious food caches nearby, so it wasn't defending its food. The experts were completely puzzled why the bear would kill Irwin, as well as why he would hike into a known bear research area. Yolanda later filed a $5 million wrongful death lawsuit against the federal government. She maintained that the warning signs had been removed, which Irwin interpreted as an all-clear to hike the area. This event has led to reforms in how bear research is conducted, and now signage is left for at least one day after the research is finished, and an agent observes the bear to ensure it is healthy and leaves the area. Yolanda's lawsuit was rejected by a federal judge in 2013. After reviewing the conflicting and confusing details of this case, I have a few questions for you. Do you think that Irwin walked right into the groggy bear and surprised him into defending himself? Do you think the bear may have smelled the researchers after they left and that triggered the attack upon him smelling Irwin? Why do you think Irwin hiked directly into an area he knew bear research was underway? Was this attack a territorial attack or a defensive attack? If Irwin had packed bear spray or a firearm, would events possibly turned out different? I will enjoy reading your comments, so please post them in the comment section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the wilds of central Alaska, just northeast of Denali National Park. The area of ferry lays along the Nanana River and is losing people quickly. In the 2020 census, it was listed as having 17 residents, down almost 50% from the prior census, which indicated 33 residents. Our story doesn't happen in the village, though, as the subjects of our episode traveled five miles into the more primitive areas nearby. Common evergreen trees of the area include black and white spruce and Sitka spruce, with stands interrupted by a quaking aspen black locust, and paper birch thickets. In riparian zones, alder bushes provide a dense lower canopy through which trails meander. This area has a rolling topography as it sits on the northern slope of the Alaska Range. The animals of this area include moose and caribou, with the main predators being black bear, wolves, and brown bear. It is in this majestic setting that our episode takes place today. In the fall of 1985, Ben Moore was a carpenter by trade and helped out in civil engineering projects. He had hunted for moose with his 14-year-old son Ty around the Blair Lakes area with nothing but sore feet to show for it. His friends felt sorry for his lack of success this year, so in a last-ditch effort they offered to accompany them to the area around Ferry to moose hunt. The group had previously dropped a camp trailer to hunt from on the far side of the old metal bridge and planned to drive across the bridge to hunt on the far side of the river. They arrived at the camp trailer in the early evening, the night before they planned to hunt. About five in the morning the hunters climbed out of bed and hopped into a jeep and a station wagon to drive up the mountain road across the bridge to get to their hunting area. Ben rode with his friend Richard in the jeep, and Ty rode with the other hunters in the roomier station wagon. At a fork in the road, the two vehicles separated and explored the promising area for game. As they scanned the dense scrub brush for the gleaming antlers of a bull moose, they took in the clear sky and fall colors that surrounded them. 
There were strong gusts of wind, but even this makes for a nice day in Alaska. After a few hours of driving and stopping periodically to glass areas, they decided to pull the jeep up on a ridge and look over the country a bit more. The wind was gusting so strongly that glassing from the jeep was more comfortable and they could see just about everything they wanted to see. They looked for a good vantage point to park the vehicle and began glassing. As Ben rounded the hill, he carefully navigated the slope and stayed out of brushy areas so as not to surprise any bear or moose. As he emerged into a large clearing, Ben pulled up his binoculars to glass the area. His field of view was quickly filled with a large, brown, fuzzy image. Whatever it was, it was so close his binoculars couldn't focus on it. He quickly took his binoculars from his eyes and felt his heart drop as he could see a large, brown bear just a hundred or so feet from him. The bear immediately stood up his hind legs, lifting his head above the brush, and began to investigate just what Ben was. It opened and closed its mouth a few times, and bobbed up and down, seemingly unsure of just what to do with this person appearing so close, so suddenly. It apparently made up its mind as it disappeared once again into the brush and got back down on all fours. Ben had studied how to behave around bears, as he was an avid outdoorsman. He knew if he didn't do anything drastic, like screaming or running, the bear may well just amble away. He stood still and focused on relaxing in a desperate hope to somehow convey a non-threatening attitude toward the bear. Suddenly the brush exploded with snapping branches and cracking as Ben watched a brown blur streaking toward him. At his side, Ben carried a .357 Magnum pistol, a single-action revolver. By the time he could pull the gun and cock the hammer, the bear was within arm's length of him. He frantically squeezed the trigger and felt his hand kick in reaction to the shot. The bullet hit the bear square in the chest, but it didn't stop or even acknowledge the impact of the bullet. As the bear ran past Ben, it clasped its jaws on his right leg and slung him over its shoulder. It then flung him backward, sending him crashing onto a large rock. Just as Ben felt himself land, he also felt the bear biting into his right leg. It hadn't even missed a step in the entire process of throwing him, and was now tearing at the muscle and skin of his right leg. Somehow Ben managed to hold onto his pistol while being flung through the air. He quickly pointed the pistol toward the bear and fired, but it was a clean miss. The stress and adrenaline of the encounter had him shaking and unsure of himself, but the bear was sure of what it wanted to do. The bear's underside was now just above Ben, so he cocked the revolver again and fired into its gut. He saw a huge wound open up in the bear's stomach and blood poured out onto him. The bear became even more enraged with the pain, and it diverted its attack to his head. It locked its jaws onto his head and shook him violently from side to side after picking him up off the ground. Ben could hear and feel the bones of his face cracking in the bear's massive jaws. Then it threw him to the ground, onto his back. For a brief second it stood over him and glared at him, with its head near his and its mouth opened wide. Just as Ben began to move, the bear lowered its mouth toward his head again, but he quickly cocked his revolver and stuck it into the bear's mouth. The bear's jaws closed around Ben's hand and the pistol, just as he fired it. The bear didn't drop dead. Instead it shook a bit and then moved its head from side to side, as if trying to stop the burning from the blast in his mouth. It quickly swiped at the pistol in recognition of the source of its pain, but Ben grasped it firmly now with both hands. The bear slowly turned and staggered its way across the clearing and back into the brush. As the bear disappeared, Ben struggled to his feet. As he stood, his right leg collapsed and he fell back to the ground. Being both tough and stubborn, he climbed back to his feet and firmly stamped his injured right leg into place as if to convince it to work. The bear's teeth had torn his face horribly, and he couldn't see to reload the revolver. Ben was now irritated and mad. He hadn't done anything to deserve such a mauling, and the bear wasn't protecting cubs or a food cache that he knew of. He bellowed a challenge to bear and declared he had one more round left in his pistol. Ben could do nothing to remove himself due to his injuries, so he waited and tried to gather himself and think about what to do. Richard heard only one of the shots from the revolver and soon appeared at the top of the small ridge. He hollered out optimistically, Did you get a moose? But Ben's reply was a disappointing statement. 
No, a bear got me. Richard incredulously asked Ben what he said, but Ben's confirmation of the events brought him down to Ben's aid. Upon seeing the damage inflicted by the bear, Richard was shaking and nervous. He helped Ben make his way back to the jeep and immediately began driving back to the trailer, about five miles down the rough mountain road. The men had driven about a hundred feet or so before the jeep quit running. Richard cautiously got out and slid underneath the vehicle while keeping a wary eye out for the bear. He banged on the malfunctioning fuel pump and once again started the jeep. As they drove along the road, they reached out to the rest of their hunting group on the CB radio, but heard no reply. As is so common in these types of stories, as soon as the jeep had reached the bridge that crossed the river, they ran into two paramedics. They had heard the cry for help over the CB radio and had called for additional help. Just as they arrived back at the trailer, an ambulance pulled up and out jumped three more paramedics. The paramedics were met with a gruesome sight. Ben's nose hung loosely from his face. They pushed it back into place and wrapped gauze around his entire head, even covering his eyes. They also put an inflatable splint around his leg before loading him into the ambulance and speeding toward the hospital five hours away in Fairbanks. As the paramedics tried to insert an IV to give him fluids, they discovered his veins had collapsed from the trauma and shock of the event. Each time Ben tried to lay down, blood seeped into his throat, causing him to cough and choke. He was forced to sit up the entire drive to the airport. Ben's leg was swelling so much that the splint had to be removed, adding to his pain and discomfort with each bump they hit. The entire ride to the airport, the paramedics didn't give him anything for pain, due to him being in a state of shock. The pain in his leg was overriding any other sense of pain in his face. Richard had to smile as he stared into Ben's shredded face and listened to him complain about pain in his thumb. Upon examination, they found a piece of one of the bear's claws had completely pierced Ben's thumb and protruded through the other side a small distance. Ben endured a five-hour ambulance ride to Fairbanks Memorial Hospital without pain medications. Upon arriving at the hospital, Ben's head was x-rayed, and he underwent a four-hour surgery. He stayed in the hospital for two more weeks. Over the next two years, he would have so many surgeries he has lost count. A plastic surgeon worked on reconstructing Ben's nose over several months, but had a very hard time as all of his facial bones were shattered during the attack. After reconstruction of his nose was complete, he had no feeling in it. Ben thanks God that Ty was not with him and still suffers from nightmares from his bear attack. Ty's presence at the attack would have traumatized him too if he had managed to avoid being attacked as well. The resources I have never indicated the age, sex, or condition of the bear and didn't indicate if it survived its wounds from Ben's revolver. After reading the research on this bear attack, I am left with several questions. What do you think Ben could have done to avoid this bear attack? Would his rifle have helped him stop the attack? What would have happened if Ben's son Ty had been with him? Do you think the bear survived? I will look forward to reading your responses, so post them in the comments section below this video, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the wilds of central Alaska, just northeast of Denali National Park. The area of ferry lays along the Nanana River and is losing people quickly. In the 2020 census, it was listed as having 17 residents, down almost 50% from the prior census, which indicated 33 residents. Our story doesn't happen in the village, though as the subjects of our episode traveled five miles into the more primitive areas nearby. Common evergreen trees of the area include black and white spruce and Sitka spruce, with stands interrupted by a quaking aspen, black locust, and paper birch thickets. In riparian zones, alder bushes provide a dense lower canopy through which trails meander. This area has a rolling topography as it sits on the northern slope of the Alaska Range. The animals of this area include moose and caribou, with the main predators being black bear, wolves, and brown bear. It is in this majestic setting that our episode takes place today. In the fall of 1985, Ben Moore was a carpenter by trade and helped out in civil engineering projects. He had hunted for moose with his 14-year-old son Ty around the Blair Lakes area, with nothing but sore feet to show for it. His friends felt sorry for his lack of success this year, so in a last-ditch effort, they offered to accompany them to the area around Ferry to moose hunt. 
The group had previously dropped a camp trailer to hunt from on the far side of the old metal bridge and planned to drive across the bridge to hunt on the far side of the river. They arrived at the camp trailer in the early evening, the night before they planned to hunt. About five in the morning the hunters climbed out of bed and hopped into a jeep and a station wagon to drive up the mountain road across the bridge to get to their hunting area. Ben rode with his friend Richard in the jeep, and Ty rode with the other hunters in the roomier station wagon. At a fork in the road, the two vehicles separated and explored the promising area for game. As they scanned the dense scrub brush for the gleaming antlers of a bull moose, they took in the clear sky and fall colors that surrounded them. There were strong gusts of wind, but even this makes for a nice day in Alaska. After a few hours of driving and stopping periodically to glass areas, they decided to pull the jeep up on a ridge and look over the country a bit more. The wind was gusting so strongly that glassing from the jeep was more comfortable and they could see just about everything they wanted to see. They looked for a good vantage point to park the vehicle and began glassing. As Ben rounded the hill, he carefully navigated the slope and stayed out of brushy areas so as not to surprise any bear or moose. As he emerged into a large clearing, Ben pulled up his binoculars to glass the area. His field of view was quickly filled with a large, brown, fuzzy image. Whatever it was, it was so close his binoculars couldn't focus on it. He quickly took his binoculars from his eyes and felt his heart drop as he could see a large, brown bear just a hundred or so feet from him. The bear immediately stood up his hind legs, lifting his head above the brush, and began to investigate just what Ben was. It opened and closed its mouth a few times, and bobbed up and down, seemingly unsure of just what to do with this person appearing so close, so suddenly. It apparently made up its mind as it disappeared once again into the brush and got back down on all fours. Ben had studied how to behave around bears, as he was an avid outdoorsman. He knew if he didn't do anything drastic, like screaming or running, the bear may well just amble away. He stood still and focused on relaxing in a desperate hope to somehow convey a non-threatening attitude toward the bear. Suddenly the brush exploded with snapping branches and cracking as Ben watched a brown blur streaking toward him. At his side, Ben carried a .357 Magnum pistol, a single-action revolver. By the time he could pull the gun and cock the hammer, the bear was within arm's length of him. He frantically squeezed the trigger and felt his hand kick in reaction to the shot. The bullet hit the bear square in the chest, but it didn't stop or even acknowledge the impact of the bullet. As the bear ran past Ben, it clasped its jaws on his right leg and slung him over its shoulder. It then flung him backward, sending him crashing onto a large rock. Just as Ben felt himself land, he also felt the bear biting into his right leg. It hadn't even missed a step in the entire process of throwing him, and was now tearing at the muscle and skin of his right leg. Somehow Ben managed to hold on to his pistol while being flung through the air. He quickly pointed the pistol toward the bear and fired, but it was a clean miss. The stress and adrenaline of the encounter had him shaking and unsure of himself, but the bear was sure of what it wanted to do. The bear's underside was now just above Ben, so he cocked the revolver again and fired into its gut. He saw a huge wound open up in the bear's stomach and blood poured out onto him. The bear became even more enraged with the pain, and it diverted its attack to his head. It locked its jaws onto his head and shook him violently from side to side after picking him up off the ground. Ben could hear and feel the bones of his face cracking in the bear's massive jaws. Then it threw him to the ground, onto his back. For a brief second it stood over him and glared at him, with its head near his and its mouth opened wide. Just as Ben began to move, the bear lowered its mouth toward his head again, but he quickly cocked his revolver and stuck it into the bear's mouth. The bear's jaws closed around Ben's hand and the pistol, just as he fired it. The bear didn't drop dead. Instead it shook a bit and then moved its head from side to side, as if trying to stop the burning from the blast in his mouth. It quickly swiped at the pistol in recognition of the source of its pain, but Ben grasped it firmly now with both hands. The bear slowly turned and staggered its way across the clearing and back into the brush. As the bear disappeared, Ben struggled to his feet. 
As he stood, his right leg collapsed and he fell back to the ground. Being both tough and stubborn, he climbed back to his feet and firmly stamped his injured right leg into place as if to convince it to work. The bear's teeth had torn his face horribly and he couldn't see to reload the revolver. Ben was now irritated and mad. He hadn't done anything to deserve such a mauling and the bear wasn't protecting cubs or a food cache that he knew of. He bellowed a challenge to Bear and declared he had one more round left in his pistol. Ben could do nothing to remove himself due to his injuries, so he waited and tried to gather himself and think about what to do. Richard heard only one of the shots from the revolver and soon appeared at the top of the small ridge. He hollered out optimistically, Did you get a moose? But Ben's reply was a disappointing statement. No, a bear got me. Richard incredulously asked Ben what he said but Ben's confirmation of the events brought him down to Ben's aid. Upon seeing the damage inflicted by the bear, Richard was shaking and nervous. He helped Ben make his way back to the jeep and immediately began driving back to the trailer, about five miles down the rough mountain road. The men had driven about a hundred feet or so before the jeep quit running. Richard cautiously got out and slid underneath the vehicle while keeping a wary eye out for the bear. He banged on the malfunctioning fuel pump and once again started the jeep. As they drove along the road, they reached out to the rest of their hunting group on the CB radio, but heard no reply. As is so common in these types of stories, as soon as the jeep had reached the bridge that crossed the river, they ran into two paramedics. They had heard the cry for help over the CB radio and had called for additional help. Just as they arrived back at the trailer, an ambulance pulled up and out jumped three more paramedics. The paramedics were met with a gruesome sight. Ben's nose hung loosely from his face. They pushed it back into place and wrapped gauze around his entire head, even covering his eyes. They also put an inflatable splint around his leg before loading him into the ambulance and speeding toward the hospital five hours away in Fairbanks. As the paramedics tried to insert an IV to give him fluids, they discovered his veins had collapsed from the trauma and shock of the event. Each time Ben tried to lay down, blood seeped into his throat, causing him to cough and choke. He was forced to sit up the entire drive to the airport. Ben's leg was swelling so much that the splint had to be removed, adding to his pain and discomfort with each bump they hit. The entire ride to the airport, the paramedics didn't give him anything for pain, due to him being in a state of shock. The pain in his leg was overriding any other sense of pain in his face. Richard had to smile as he stared into Ben's shredded face and listened to him complain about pain in his thumb. Upon examination, they found a piece of one of the bear's claws had completely pierced Ben's thumb and protruded through the other side a small distance. Ben endured a five-hour ambulance ride to Fairbanks Memorial Hospital without pain medications. Upon arriving at the hospital, Ben's head was x-rayed, and he underwent a four-hour surgery. He stayed in the hospital for two more weeks. Over the next two years, he would have so many surgeries he has lost count. A plastic surgeon worked on reconstructing Ben's nose over several months, but had a very hard time as all of his facial bones were shattered during the attack. After reconstruction of his nose was complete, he had no feeling in it. Ben thanks God that Ty was not with him and still suffers from nightmares from his bear attack. Ty's presence at the attack would have traumatized him too if he had managed to avoid being attacked as well. The resources I have never indicated the age, sex, or condition of the bear and didn't indicate if it survived its wounds from Ben's revolver. After reading the research on this bear attack, I am left with several questions. What do you think Ben could have done to avoid this bear attack? Would his rifle have helped him stop the attack? What would have happened if Ben's son Ty had been with him? Do you think the bear survived? I will look forward to reading your responses, so post them in the comments section below this video, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the frigid north of the Yukon Territory, Canada. Just outside of the town of Whitehorse is some of the most valuable mineral resources in the world. This brings large corporately owned mining operations to the area and that of course brings jobs. Just about 30 kilometers east of the town is a mining operation near Ross River owned by Aurora Geosciences LTD. Just south of Ross River is mountainous terrain, but to the north is lowland dotted with muskeg and many small lakes. The predominant trees in the area include white spruce, black spruce, birch, and lodgepole pine. 
This area is home to moose, mountain goats, and sheep, with the main predators of this area being wolves, black bears, and grizzly bears. On April 28, 2006, 28 year old Jean Francois Page was flagging for the mining company he worked for. This was the first day of his third year of employment with Aurora Geosciences, and his friends called him JF for short. He was originally from Bon Secours, Quebec, Canada, and had come up north for a lucrative job in the mines in 2002. He had embraced a primitive and difficult lifestyle by living in an off-grid cabin without running water while he lived in Whitehorse. Over his brief life, he had done everything from being a census worker in Nunavut to working at Cannes as a film critic. He was a jack-of-all-trades and had embraced the society and culture around Whitehorse. On the day in question, he and two co-workers were tasked with marking out some mineral claims in the area for future use by the mining company. They had to carry heavy cables, an axe, stakes, and their GPS system. They routinely worked in the bush and would occasionally have run-ins with bears, but always managed to get out of the confrontation unscathed. They carried too much equipment with them to carry a firearm of any type and didn't pack bear spray either. Spring is a precarious season for brown bears emerging from hibernation. They are just bringing their cubs out of the den, and this is when they are most protective of them. The cubs can weigh only 10 pounds or so and require the protection of their mother from larger boars who will kill and eat the cubs, just to bring the sow back into estrus for breeding. At this time of year, all brown bears are emerging from their dens after not eating for several months and are extremely hungry. This puts them and any human they may encounter in a very tenuous situation. If the bears are prone to view humans as a threat or a food source or surprise them, then the potential for an attack is heightened. The three men finished up a few hours of work and began gathering their things to return to their work camp. The two men who were working with Jean-Francois had left the area a few minutes ahead of him and were making their way, leaving him behind. Once they arrived at the work camp, they waited several minutes, then a short while for Jean-Francois to get back to camp, but he never did. The men soon grew concerned and contacted a helicopter pilot working at their work camp. The pilot hopped into the helicopter and flew back to the location the men were working. As he hovered over the area, he could see a human body lying still on the ground. He notified ground searchers, and they went in and located J.F.'s remains. Jean-Francois was torn up severely and was the apparent victim of a bear attack. After searching the area for evidence, they found a bear den that had seen sign of two cubs having occupied the den. The track evidence told the story quite clearly. When the other men left Jean-Francois, he had deviated slightly from their return path, probably to save some time on the return trip. He had unknowingly wandered to within five yards of the brown bear den that hid the two cubs. Judging by the track evidence at the attack scene and the wounds on Jean-Francois's body, the attack was sudden, brutal, and immediately fatal. Officials would note that they were certain he died almost instantly upon initiation of the attack. The review of the evidence showed that the sow was surprised by the sudden presence of Paige near her cubs. They were convinced that this attack was a defensive attack, due to his body not being cached for food. Jean-Francois Page was simply killed in a blitz of an attack, and his body left in the open, uneaten. Jean-Francois left many friends behind with his passing. They stated that he loved the North and embraced the rigors of hard work. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police and some conservation officers attempted to locate the sow and cubs. They decided that the sow needed to be killed due to the aggression she showed to Jean-Francois. The cubs were also put down because they were still dependent on their mother for survival. In the aftermath of JF's attack and death, the Yukon Workers' Compensation and Safety Board investigated the circumstances surrounding the incident. They filed six charges against Aurora Geosciences pertaining to inadequate training for their employees. The charges claimed that the employees were not aware of the dangers of working in bear country and were not provided adequate protective equipment. The company maintained that employees are always provided with bear spray and bear bangers, which are firework-like devices designed to frighten a bear away. Prior to this attack, the last human fatality due to brown bear attack occurred in 1996 when a female hiker was killed near Kluane. This attack will be featured on our next episode. After reviewing the facts of this incident, I have a few questions for you. Do you think that if his cohorts had waited for him that this incident may have come out differently? 
Why do you think the men didn't have the bear bangers or bear spray on hand since the company provided them? Do you think the sow charged J.F. with the intent to predate upon him? Do you agree with the citations of the mining company? I will enjoy reading your responses, so post your comments below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode whisks us away to very familiar territory. We're going back to the Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada, and specifically to Opiongo Lake. Algonquin Provincial Park is Canada's oldest park and was formed in 1893. The topography of the park consists of rolling forested lowlands under 1,500 feet in elevation. The land has been shaped by eons of glacial activity, grinding the mountains down into rounded hills with valleys filled with till, or soil derived from ground rock. The trees of the area range from dense stands of jack pine, white birch, and poplar scattered through pine forests. The waters here are extremely productive for fishermen. Common animals of the area include white-tailed deer, moose, and possibly woodland caribou, and a few elk. The predators of this area include lynx, wolves, and black bear. Toward the southern end of the lake is an island called Bates Island. I know what you're thinking. Bates Motel, Bates Island. It is an eerie coincidence, but there is no hotel on this island. In fact, there aren't supposed to be any bears on it either. Opiango Lake is about 9 miles long, but is only just under 8 miles wide at its widest point. It narrows at the southern end of the lake to just under a half a mile wide at Bates Island, but the landmass of the island cuts this width to only a few hundred yards in total. The island sort of forms a land bridge that any animal willing to take a short swim could use to get from one side of the large lake to another. The island is small, only measuring a little over a half mile long and about a tenth of a mile wide, but is very long and thin in shape. On October 11, 1999, 32-year-old Raymond Jacoboscus and his 48-year-old companion, Carola Frihi, had just paddled out to the island and began to set up camp. The two had unpacked their tents and sleeping bags after finding a satisfactory place to camp with a beautiful view. The water shimmered as the late afternoon light bounced off the ripples, and the two adventurers were settling in for a relaxing night by themselves. They must have felt very safe on this island, knowing that any animal looking to make its way onto it would have to swim there, and would probably be heard by the couple as it approached. The island seems fortress-like in its isolation, complete with a moat of water for protection. Fall is an interesting season for bears. They're in a state called hyperphagia, which is when they have a ravenous appetite in an attempt to pack on as much fat as they can before heading into hibernation for the winter. They're dependent upon berry yields and an overabundance of food to meet their needs during this time, and sometimes they do not quite get enough calories, and their appetites lead them to easy, alternative food sources. As the two set up camp, a rustling began in the bushes near their camp. As they looked over toward the noise, a very large and inquisitive black bear emerged from them. When a black bear is in predator mode, it doesn't typically run up to its prey. Rather, it puts its head down low and pins its ears back, looking for a hidden avenue of approach. It doesn't usually take a direct line toward its prey, but approaches in an oblique route as if it were just passing by. It will frequently act oblivious to the presence of its prey in an attempt to convince the prey it's in no danger, but the body language of the bear is very clear to those who understand it. Given that both people were found dead, it is assumed that the bear began by approaching Corolla first, and Raymond stepped in to defend her. The large black bear used its powerful paws to break each of their necks in a lightning fast and merciful death. After both people were laying dead on the ground, it dragged their bodies into the dense vegetation on the island and did what bear experts call caching. When a bear caches a carcass it plans to consume, it covers the remains in leaves, sticks, and dirt, and then defecates or urinates on them. This acts as a mask to any odors that develop from decomposition of the carcass and lets other animals know that the carcass is already claimed as a meal by the bear. Both Raymond and Carola's bodies were cached in this manner. For the next five days, the bear fed from their bodies and stood guard over them, keeping any possible competition from feeding on them. After a few days had passed, and the two had not made it back to their prearranged check-in point, park police officers were sent out to the island to check on them. When they arrived, they were confronted by a large and now angry black bear who was refusing to leave, and clearly claiming the cached bodies as its own. The park officials shot the bear and began their investigation of the gruesome and fatal incident. Raymond and Corolla's remains were recovered and sent to officials for investigation and to complete the process of certifying the circumstances surrounding their deaths. 
The bear was found to be a young male which weighed in at 308 pounds. This may sound like a very large bear, but given the time of year, he was not. Black bears need to consume between 15,000 and 20,000 calories every day for months on end to reach ideal hibernation weight. And given that a large fish might have several hundred calories, you can easily see it isn't always as easy nor a successful venture for them. Not only that, they need a relatively high amount of sugar in their diet so that their calories are converted to fat, so a bad berry season may negatively affect their efforts in achieving the needed fat accumulation for hibernation. Regarding the attack, a park naturalist referred to this attack as a strictly predatory attack and described it as right off the scale of normal bear behavior. Given the bear wasn't described as emaciated, injured, nor older and declining in health, it is unusual, but it is all too common as our channel demonstrates. The attack on Raymond and Corolla inspired author Claire Cameron to write a fictional novel centered around a similar plot. It isn't a factual recounting of the attack, but is an interesting story told from a five-year-old girl's perspective. It may be an interesting read for you. I've linked to it below, so if you like fictional writing, check it out. So after compiling the information surrounding this attack, I'm wondering, do you think this attack was a predatory attack or possibly a territorial attack? Do you think that bear spray or firearms would possibly have changed the outcome of the attack? Did Raymond and Corolla violate any bear-aware precepts? I will enjoy reading your comments, so please post your thoughts in the comment section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below, so check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in their country.